I'd like for you to think back to a moment that you felt defined you in a way. You felt that things shifted or that things changed, whether through your perspective or the idea of what you wanted to become. And for me, that moment was when I was 17. I got my first camera. It was in Pentax Spotmatic, and it was this old film camera. And it was from the 70s, which for me was kind of a relic. So it was this beautiful kind of antique thing to hold and to be able to take photos with. And I got it on the verge of a road trip to California. And I was with my friend Gabe, and, and through these experiences of traveling from Virginia to California, I was able to grasp an, an, an idea of what it was to become a photographer. And this camera, this very small piece of equipment, it's, it ignited something in me that, that I wanted to pursue. It changed the way that I saw myself, and it made me realize that I wanted to become a photographer. And so much so that throughout high school, I continued to pursue studying photography, which I was homeschooled. Are there any other homeschoolers in here? Homeschool high five. <laughs> so at graduation, I was, I was packing everything that I owned into a car that wasn't mine. And with $1,000 to my name, I was again driving to California. And I had a new camera at that time. And so I was, for me, it was this embarking moment of I was, I was taking my first big step. And as I got to school, it, so much of what we all expect, I think, through education, and you know, there's an, a load of assignments. You're going to be overwhelmed, and you're going to be stressed. But what I didn't anticipate was getting burned out. And I didn't anticipate not wanting to pick up my camera for these assignments. And I had a professor, Chris Orwig, who talked about when you reach these moments, you need to take a step back. You need to find what initially inspired you. And you need to, to, in a way, reinvent yourself, reinvent your art, reinvent the way that you view your craft. And so with that, I was able to come back with a renewed vision, in a way, reinventing what photography was for me, so that three and a half years later, I was able to graduate. And in the midst of graduation, I had some friends that went to New Zealand. And New Zealand has been on my bucket list to go to. And so I graduate from school, and I get a call from them, and they're like, you've got to get here. You've got to come visit this place. It's unbelievable. It will blow your mind. So five days later, I find myself in a van for two months traveling around the South Island of New Zealand. And this experience was, it was like I was actually getting up and doing it. It was like four years ago, I said, I want to become a photographer, and here I am through this very difficult course, very difficult path, but here I am doing it. I'm in New Zealand. I'm living and breathing the natural world, which is so much of what I'm passionate about. And as I am there taking photos and taking photos well, I'm able to see differently, and I'm able to explain and even communicate through photographs what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. And I get back to the States, and in the throes of being a postgraduate of, of which jobs do I apply for and do I want to stay in Southern California, do I go back home to Virginia, I plan this road trip with my sister, and we're going we're gonna to be driving back east to visit some family. And as we, I drive up to Seattle, I pick her up, we start heading east, we decide to detour through Glacier National Park. And as we're driving up to Glacier, bam, everything goes black. I wake up inside of a CAT scan tube, freaking out. Doctors and nurses are saying, be calm, be still, don't move. I, I black out again. When I regain consciousness fully, I come to find out that as we had slowed to make that turn, a car came flying up behind us and hit us going 120 miles an hour. And it was in the midst of this, in the confusion of this, Ambulances are rushing to the scene, and I was unconscious, but apparently I was mumbling things. And they thought that I had gone crazy, that I had completely lost my mind, because I was telling them that I was Taylor Swift. <laughs> and there's a miraculous aspect of this that I can't explain and never will be able to, but that my sister and I walked out of the hospital the next day, that we were not injured beyond repair. We were brittle, but we were not broken. And for the next six months, I was in physical therapy. My shoulder had been hit in the accident, and it hurt to lift up my arm for several months, let alone to pick up my camera. And that initial spark that I had felt with photography and that love and that desire was starting to fade. And as I was wrestling with, with depression and with self-pity and with what it was to be an artist that couldn't create because I couldn't use my craft, my tool. And it was Thanksgiving of that year, I was talking with my sister, and she said, Taylor, you know, I thought that you had died. The car 
The way that it spun around, you were slumped over, I thought that you died for the first several minutes. And when she said that to me, it was like someone just grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me. Because I had allowed myself to sink into these moments. I had allowed myself to wallow in self-pity. And yes, there's a healthy amount of emotional that needs to be processed through with a traumatic experience. But I had, I had gone beyond that and I would let myself sink. And when she shared that with me, it was like, despite where I had been, despite where I had allowed myself to flow, that, that I did have this dream and that I had this dream that was worth pursuing. And it was because I wasn't able to use my camera that I was able to look at things a little bit differently in a way. I was able to, to focus on things that I was fo excited about, but because of my desire for photography, I'd maybe lost sight of. I was able to volunteer for a year with Invisible Children. And with the community that was there, I was able to delve into what it looked like of not just pursuing my own dream, but pursuing a communal dream, of gathering around with people that were like-minded and of pursuing something that was bigger than myself. And now three years removed from the accident, I can look back and I can see that the depth of that accident, that the pain of that produced depth in myself. It produced depth in the community that I was in, and it produced depth to myself as a photographer. And as I look at the community that was in Invisible Children, I'm able to see how when I allowed them to be a part of that experience, then the pain and the depth that I was feeling, that I allowed that community to go deeper together. And that when I experienced someone else's pain through what they were sharing, I was allowing that relationship to go deeper. And then when I allowed them to be part of my dream to become a photographer, this me, me, me that I had been pushing for for so many years was finally able to become, I'm not just a photographer, but I'm a photographer that wants to have an impact on the people around me. A photographer that wants to have an impact socially and globally to use the images that I take to produce change. And looking back, I'm able to see with such clarity that just as Dr. King proclaims from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial that I have a dream, that his words have so much meaning because of the community, of the force, and of the move movement that was behind him and the depth to that movement. And just like I believe that I have a dream that is worth pursuing, I believe that you have a dream that is worth pursuing. Jay Maisel, a photographer, was asked, how do I become a better photographer? He responded by saying, become a more interesting person. If we can look back at these experiences and see that they're creating depth to ourselves and depth to our community, and when we allow that community to be a part of it, what can we reach? What is our unlimited potential? Where can we move forward when, when I'm helping you reach your dream and you're helping me reach mine, and our dream is no longer about us, it's about each other and it's about moving this, this, this nation forward, this generation forward. Ronald Reagan once said, the future is not for the faint of heart. The future is for the brave. And I encourage you that as we're standing right now on this brink, no longer having to look back at how we made it to this far, but we can, we can learn from the past and we can realize that we're standing on a moment right now that our next step can produce that great dream. Our next moment can produce something so beautiful that we could never imagine it. And I encourage you, to fight for that. Because through my experiences, I've realized that this life is short. I've realized that this life is very fragile. And despite my best efforts and the best efforts of science, there's some things we can't predict and we can't control. And that your dream is worth fighting for. Your dream is worth living for. But that it demands action. And it demands courage. So take action and take courage because it's worth it. Thank you.